Mizzou football is officially returning to St. Louis next season. And I did a deep film study on the Georgia Bulldogs game. I have more thoughts, of course, including a player that if Missouri utilizes offensively a little bit more, I think they can get significantly better. So let's talk about that and more right now on Locked on Mizzou. You are Locked on Mizzou, your daily podcast on the Missouri Tigers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, all you true sons and daughters, I'm John Miller, your Mizzou mafioso and the central scrutinizer of Missouri Tigers football and basketball each and every weekday. And I'd like to thank LinkedIn Jobs for being the official college football recruiting sponsor across the Locked On College Network. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Terms and conditions apply. And apparently, there may be something in in the contract between Missouri and Memphis that said, hey, well, we'll play you down in Memphis, but hey, terms and conditions apply. So it turns out the new Missouri administration, including Desiree Reed Francois and Eli Drinkwitz, of course, wasn't really wanting to play a group of five road game. And in some ways, I can't blame them, but I have to say my first initial take was, Oh, just go down there and play them. We don't need to waste a bunch of money moving the game. But I have to say, now that it's official, having a game back at the Trans World Dome for the first time, well, I guess it's no longer the TWA Dome, is it? TWA no longer exists. I'm aging myself there a tiny bit, but what is it? The Dome at America's Center? I believe that's what it's called now. Well, no longer will it just be home to XFL football games and Garth Brooks concerts. Yes, An occasional Missouri football game as well. According to Dave Matter and his reporting, the game will be part of a renewed partnership with the St. Louis Sports Commission to host even more events in St. Louis in 2023 and 2024. So could there be another Mizzou event in 2024 as well? Quite possibly, so stay tuned. So that means the beginning of next year's football schedule looks pretty manageable especially considering the Tigers won't have to leave the state now for the month of September. So hopefully maybe a 4-0 start if the Tigers can take down Kansas State, give them a taste of their own medicine in week three next year. Who knows? Could be a, could be, it'll obviously be a tough task against the Wildcats, but like I said, a real chance for Missouri to get off to a fast start next year with that Memphis game, of course, now being a neutral site in St. Louis. But I'll tell you, it occurred to me the other day I was watching the movie Pop Star. Perhaps you've heard of it, the Andy Samberg Lonely Island vehicle from 2016. Well, it's kind of a send-up of not only modern music, it's a little bit of a Justin Bieber parody, the, the parody of his movie from around the same time as well. But there's a funny part of that movie where where Samberg's character, Connor For Real, they're they're breaking down his ridiculously bloated staff. And for instance, one guy, Connor, just pays to be shorter than him, a perspective skewer, so he can look taller in pictures. And, that, and also another example, there's a, a one more example here. There's a guy that he pays just to punch him in the groin in order to keep him humble. Well, you know what? I figured out something. That's what the Missouri Tigers are to me. Occasionally, they just have to punch me in the groin to keep me humble. And certainly the last couple weeks have kept me humble, no doubt about that. But you know what? If you need a silver lining, this is again according to Dave Matter at St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Over the last four years, only four offenses have averaged more yards per play versus Georgia than Missouri did this past Saturday. That's five and a half yards per play. And those four teams, other than Missouri, featured each of the last three Heisman Trophy winners, and all all four were led by a quarterback who finished no worse than fourth in Heisman voting. 
So for as much as the Tiger defense generated the headlines and with good reason, there's a lot of positives with the Missouri offense as well. Now, obviously, penalties and lack of execution in the red zone were killer in that ball game. Missouri easily wins if they if they remove those two factors. Missouri almost certainly wins that game. But again, if you're feeling down, that's a good reason to feel a little bit more positive. And by the way, a real real surprising and, and moving moment, I thought. I knew that Gary Pinkle was going to be honored for being in the College Football Hall of Fame at the timeout, the first time out there in the first quarter, but I was not expecting Brad Smith and Chase Kaufman to unveil his name on the wall there. That was that was really incredible and very classily and well done by Missouri. I thought it was fantastic. Unfortunately, one tiny little detail misspelled Gary Pinkle's name on the video board during the unveiling. Now, thankfully, it was spelled correctly on the wall. That would have been an all-time gaffe, and whoever somebody did take down that graphic on the big board before I was able to snap a picture of it. Others got a shot of it, so it definitely happened, trust me. But that was a little bit embarrassing. I'm guessing I'm guessing somebody was yelled at there. I would I certainly would have if I was in charge. But hey, we're only the best journalism school in the world, people. Maybe we could learn how to spell the uh, greatest coach of all time his name. Maybe maybe do a little uh copy editing next time. Just a thought. <laughs> By the way, apologies for the somewhat late posting, later than usual, that's for sure, of this edition of Locked on Mizzou, but I was doing my my all-22 film study of this ball game, took a little bit longer than I expected, also got caught up with some off-mic issues as well, but that's okay. You know what? I will post that all-22 film study, which is YouTube exclusive and ad-free over at my YouTube page. Just find it at LockedOnMizzou.com. I believe it's the first link there right at the top. Simple as that. But you know what? I have plenty of thoughts for you. If you don't want to watch that whole thing, I have my thoughts from that film study. More thoughts as I delved even more deeply into this Missouri-Georgia game. Coming right up, including how Missouri's defense was able to get the job done. And one offensive player, I think, should be more involved prominently on that end of the field. But first, I want to tell you about our title sponsor, which is LinkedIn Jobs. And you know, these days, high stakes every time you hire somebody. Because let's face it, it's legally speaking, it's hard to get rid of the people sometimes. You want to make sure you get the right person. You want to hire the right person the first time. And that's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. Because with simple tools like screening questions, They make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and, most importantly, hire. So LinkedIn Jobs, once again, helps you find the candidates you want to talk to, the qualified candidates you want to talk to, faster. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash lockedoncollege. That's linkedin.com slash Locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. So the last time I truly did a deep film study for Missouri was week one against Louisiana Tech. And if my memory serves me correctly, I think Missouri played zone for the majority of that ball game defensively. Now, in this one against Georgia, it was a completely different plan because for the majority of that game, not only did Missouri play man defense, they played pretty darn aggressive man defense as well, often bringing five, six, and occasionally seven guys on the rush, trying to speed up Stetson Bennett's clock for sure, and often successfully to a lot a lot of success, without a doubt. I mean, there were exceptions, of course, You know, he changed it up on occasion, but I'm telling you, just go back and watch, if you can, a whole lot of man-to-man defense. Now, third and 20, I know for sure, in the red zone one time, Missouri played a very soft zone and kept everything in front of them wisely. They They forced the field goal. Smart play. But again, 
just lots of man blitzes, sending extra guys, and impressively, the Missouri secondary was able to hold up for the most part. Ennis Rakestraw, in particular, I thought played one of his best ball games as a Tiger. There were times when Georgia was perhaps not trying to pick on him, but certainly they would prefer to throw to his man instead of, say, Chris Abrams' drains side of the field. But Rakestraw made several pass breakups. And just generally speaking, I, I thought looking back played one of his absolute best games as a Tiger. Another thing that stood out looking at the coach's cam view of this Missouri-Georgia game is that, quite honestly, Luther Burden has been having a tough time getting separation. It's something that I'd worried about watching the Tigers on television and maybe not as closely against, say, Abilene Christian. I just didn't have the energy to break down a FCS opponent. I hate to say it, but Watching this game, it was a little bit alarming that Burden wasn't really getting a whole lot of separation. Now, a part of that, frankly, was the defensive backs are all over him lately. I was joking in the stands that he's being refereed like an NBA rookie trying to guard LeBron James or something, but it really was kind of remarkable how how few times he gets the benefit of the doubt until, well, toward the end of the game, he started getting... He got a crucial call or two for sure. But I think, really, I think Burden is obviously an incredibly talented player. I think it's just a matter of, hey, getting off the line of scrimmage for a true freshman, it's something you got to figure out because every single one of these guys in this league, to some extent, is going to be really physical and really fast, and there's no off weeks. And just the simple getting off the line at times, especially – to get open on those nine routes, those streaks all the way down the field, the the go-long type plays, to put it more simply, it's just not really been there so far for Missouri and Burden, despite them trying it on several different occasions. But I will say there is one receiver who stood out that was getting open deep down the field, granted in completely different circumstances than what Burden was put in, and that's Mookie Cooper. Obviously, he had the big play over the top, the biggest pass play of the day for Missouri on the long ball from Brady Cook, but there were also several other occasions where Cooper was from his slot position, especially after Dominic Lovett was injured in the second half and unable to play. Well, Cooper was finding seams down the middle of the field. Sometimes Brady Cook either was looking a different direction or didn't have time to see him or, frankly, should have just seen him in general. Maybe she'll let the play develop a little more. A mixed bag of all three of those scenarios, I think. But the point is, if I'm a Missouri coach and I'm going back and watching this film, I'm going, man, we got to get Mookie Cooper involved a little bit more. And not just in gadget plays where he gets uh, the occasional screen pass or, you know, the jet sweeps, all that, all that good stuff. Nothing wrong with any of that, of course, but I just think he's, he looks like much more than a gadget player to me, especially when on that deep ball, you know, the ball was kind of thrown a little bit inside and under thrown. I think I'll have to go back. I'll have to go back and remember what I said about the actual throw, but regardless, the point is Mookie had to jump up and go get that thing. He's like five foot eight or something, and he was still able to high point the football against a Georgia defensive back and pull it down. So to me, even when Dominic Lovett comes back, I'm, I'm going to say it till I'm blue in the face, I guess. I just want to see some looks with Cooper in one slot, Lovett in another slot. What's wrong with having two explosive guys in the slot? There's nothing that says that you have to put a quote-unquote possession guy there, although at this point, Dominic Lovett's a pretty good possession receiver along with being an explosive player as well. But my point is, if I'm Missouri, I've got to figure out a way to get Mookie Cooper more involved because now that he's healthy this season compared to last season, he just looks like a completely different guy to me, especially showing up and flashing on film against the Georgia Bulldogs. Well, that just tells me, especially with Lovett being the number one guy, with Burden having a lot of attention as well, obviously. He's going to get one of your best defensive backs on the outside. Well, Mookie Cooper's going to have some opportunities to eat 
against safeties and linebackers, star players, hybrids, whatever you want to call it, not true number one cornerbacks. And with a guy who's a former five-star player with his speed and, and just raw talent, I think that's something Missouri has to take advantage of, especially with it. Not It's not just – it's not just talent at this point. I saw it on film. He was getting open and running good routes. I think he's got to get more action. And coming up, I have a partial explanation, but not a full explanation about the bizarre illegal low block call on the Missouri defense against Georgia. But first, I want to tell you about one of our finest sponsors, betonline.net, your number one source for football betting information this season and of course major league baseball's coming up the playoffs hockey getting they're about to drop the puck on the nhl regular season and as always bet online remains your continued source for all your sports wagering information with live betting and up to the minute scores for every sport you could possibly imagine heck international stuff like club soccer of course The World Cup's coming up as well, even boxing, MMA, and golf. So head to betonline.net on your mobile device to learn more. Once again, it's BetOnline, where the game starts. So as Missouri fans are well aware, we just played Army in in a bowl game last season. Well, cut blocks are not illegal. Per se. Now, there are types and and situations where cut blocks are illegal. In fact, for years, it's been illegal to cut block a defender while he's engaged with another offensive player. In other words, you just can't cut block a guy while he's and double team him with a cut block. You can't take out his legs while he's being blocked by another offensive lineman, for example. But apparently, this past off season, there's been another another restriction in cut blocking and that is you're no longer able to cut block somebody outside of the tackle box so once you get outside of the tackle the tight end well no no cut blocking in the open field there's a few different explanations for that but that sort of again this is where I said it was a partial explanation that sort of explains why Martez Manuel I believe was flagged for 15 yards on a play, even though he was on defense, because, well, there was a pulling lineman that got outside of the tackle box. Now, this man, by the way, outweighs Martez Manuel by 100 pounds, probably. He sees it coming the entire way. He's not, he sees Manuel coming the entire time anyway. Perhaps he didn't see the cut block coming. Block, by the way, he's he's on defense. Is it really a block at that point? That's the other thing, because in this explanation, in this new rule, the stories I've seen on it, it says nothing about it applying to a defensive player. So while yes, the offensive lineman was outside of the tackle box, and Martez Manuel definitely cut him down at the knees. That's not a block though, <laughs> because he's not on offense. So to me, I just don't understand that call whatsoever. I, I've never in none of my research did I see that, oh, by the way, this applies to the defense as well. So I just found that completely bizarre. And maybe there's some officials out there who happen to listen to this podcast. If you have an explanation for me, I'd love to hear it. Hit me up locked on Mizzou at gmail.com or at locked on Mizzou on Twitter or anywhere on social media. And finally, a forgotten play, I think, in this ball game. Missouri up 10 with about 12 minutes and 40 seconds left. Damian Wilson, the young linebacker for the Tigers, I believe this is his second year in the program. Notice I didn't call him a freshman or sophomore because who the heck knows at this point? With COVID and the free year, it's hard for me to even wrap my mind around what the actual traditional designation for these guys is. I'm just trying to figure out, like, how many years do they have left in terms of eligibility? That's all I really need to know at this point. But the point is, Damian Wilson, I I just want to say I'm not even mad at you, pal, because you actually made an incredible instinctual play here. Because Wilson, again, 
aggressive man-to-man defense by Missouri. By the way, Wilson played a solid ball game in Chad Bailey's stead, who was out. Another Again, you start thinking about the amount of players that were actually out for Missouri in this game. Chad Bailey missed the game. Chris Abrams drained, and Dominic Lovett essentially missed a half of the game. That's pretty brutal on top of the offensive line injuries that Missouri's already suffered so far. But Damian Wilson played a good game. Missouri playing really aggressive man-to-man defense once again. Well, Damian Wilson, clearly his man was in the backfield. He had the running back on this particular play I'm talking about with about 12 and a half minutes left. But Wilson, seeing, takes a step forward, but seeing that his man is staying in the block. He's not running a pass route. It's clearly not a screen. He's staying in the block. So what does Wilson do? Well, he wisely realizes, even though he takes a step forward, I don't have time to blitz here. So you know what? I'm actually going to step back here, and out of the corner of his right eye, I'm pretty sure Wilson sees a crossing route coming. He undercuts this route, jumps up, stretches his arms as high as he possibly can, ball deflects off his hands, incomplete. And again, Damian Wilson, I just want to make this really clear to you. I'm not mad at you whatsoever. You made a great play there. I'm just saying, man, So close, so close, so close, because go back and watch my film study, which I'll post here either in the next few hours or sometime tomorrow. Damian Wilson, if he catches that ball, if that ball is just thrown maybe a foot lower by Stetson Bennett, I mean, he catches that and probably goes to the end zone. There's hardly anybody over there on the right side. And if Missouri goes up three possessions there, it's probably curtains for the dogs. So, Anyway, just wanted to point that out, something that was forgotten there. Didn't want to rip your heart out once again, but actually, you know what I did? What we all needed was a good shot to the crotch for us to stay humble. But you know what? Hopefully you've enjoyed this show better than a crotch shot in all seriousness. And in all seriousness, thanks for listening. As always, thanks for telling a friend to go to Locked on Mizzou dot com and why not make chris gordy's locked on sec your second listen today once again make locked on sec your second listen so until next time i'm john miller and thanks for listening to locked on mizzou